Hi friends. Hi friends. It's your FDW president, Oyin Mitchell. And your first vice president, Ogechi Opara. Trying to interview candidates during a runoff election can be almost impossible. But we were fortunate. We have interviewed both Democratic candidates for Secretary of State, B. Wynn and D. Dawkins Hagler. As the runoff election has come to a close, we want to honor some of our candidates who have taken the leap to run for office and take a look at their platform and why they wanted to run and what they hope to achieve. Win or lose, we know that these candidates will continue to stay involved in their communities, and we hope that lifting up these conversations can inspire others who may be interested in running in the future. We start with B. Wynn, a nonprofit executive and organizer who was elected to fill Stacey Abrams' House District 89 seat when she ran for governor in 2018. Since then, B. has been considered a leading advocate for voter rights at the Capitol, overturning the exact match law and giving back voting rights to 53,000 Georgians. In the wake of 2020, she has also defended the accuracy of Georgia's election by combating Trump's big lie about election fraud with clear and compelling truths. We follow that with an interview with Secretary of State candidate D. Dawkins Hagler, a minister, educator, activist, and former legislator who served for over eight years in House District 93. D. has served as the chair of the Georgia Legislative Black Caucus and as chair of the Georgia Women's Legislative Caucus. She is a sought-after media personality and convenes leaders nationally and internationally around human rights issues. She has long been a proponent of women taking elected and appointed offices. Both candidates have been advocates and role models for young girls, and they would make history in their own rights if elected. I interview B, and then Oyan interviews D. We end with a conversation with Insurance Commissioner candidate Raphael Baker. So let's begin. <laughs> So good to have you. Hi, Ogechi. Thank you for having me on and great to see you. So I want to start by asking you about the race itself for Secretary of State. Oftentimes voters are coming to a primary interested in who's at the top of the ticket. Why should this Secretary of State race matter to Georgians? The Secretary of State's race is going to be one of the most important races here in our state, but also across the country as well. The Secretary of State's office is responsible for overseeing a number of things, including corporations, licensure, and nonprofit divisions. But the most important thing we're facing in this moment is protecting the future of our democracy. And the Secretary of State is responsible for overseeing our elections division. And that means we've got to protect the freedom to vote for every eligible Georgian, ensure that we're doing everything that we can so that voters can access the ballot box without barriers and that when they go and cast their votes, those votes are counted and the results are upheld. Thank you so much. So, you know, we've heard a lot of misinformation about elections from uh, Republicans. How do you address that messaging as you're running? Well, I think that's a really great question because election misinformation is one of the biggest threats that we're facing, and it is designed to divide Georgians and Americans, and it works very, very well, and it moves very rapidly. So I think there are a number of things that uh, I would do as Secretary of State, and I have been doing that as a state lawmaker, which is unequivocally rejecting the big lie, the misinformation, and the conspiracy theories, and really help the public understand the nuances of election laws and exactly what's going on. Um, but really, what we have to do here is put a plan into place. As Secretary of State, I would create a division that solely focuses on monitoring election disinformation, and I would use a model similar to the state of Colorado. That division monitors these off-site, offshoot websites where a misinformation is being created and then fueled. It's non-traditional media sources. So monitoring these sites to catch election misinformation. And once those threats are flagged, work with local law enforcement, work with our local election boards, ensure that we're briefing them and giving them the right uh, strategy and talking points to mitigate that election information. And that other portion of this that's critically important is 
The Secretary of State has got to continue to build relationships with people in the community and send representatives out into the community to let voters know exactly what's going on and how to address the misinformation that is being um, pushed by the far right base. Wow. So this is a likely hypothetical scenario. Um, you're declared the winner of the runoff on June 21st. Um, you've mentioned a number of things that are really critically important. What's your first order of business to make sure that Democrats defeat the incumbent in November? I think the first order of business for Democrats is to ensure we know exactly who the incumbent is. There is a lot of conversation around the fact that the current Secretary of State followed the law. He didn't find those extra 11,000 votes um, but we have to remember in Georgia that following the law should be the bare minimum for anyone holding any elected position, including the Secretary of State's office, and that Georgians have a better option and we actually deserve better. In the aftermath of the 2020 election, uh, the current Secretary of State supported Senate Bill 202, that 98-page voter suppression bill that criminalizes handing out a bottle of water to a voter waiting in line, that 98-page voter suppression bill that enables a partisan legislature and a partisan state board of elections to take over our local election boards. And he's currently running on two issues that are based on lies and conspiracy theories. One, the idea that non-citizens are voting, which is illegal and it is not true. It's in our constitution and it's in our, our Georgia code. And two, the idea that Georgians are ballot harvesting, which is also not true. We recently saw a state board of elections meeting where three Georgians were accused of ballot harvesting. This idea that people are collecting massive ballots, dropping them off for other people. And those three Georgians were dismissed unanimously by a Republican controlled state board of elections because they were following the law. We are allowed to, by Georgia law, drop off absentee ballots for family members and for those living in the same household. So how important is it for every single person to go out and get to the polls this election? It's critically important that we mobilize Democratic voters to get out this election cycle. We know that we can do it. Our infrastructure in Georgia is strong. We have great organizers that um, started in Georgia and remained in Georgia. And we know this isn't a fluke. So we saw we delivered a win in 2020 for the president. We came back in January and delivered two wins for Senator Ossoff and Senator Warnock. And then in the 2021 municipal cycle, we delivered wins across the state of Georgia, flipping municipal seats and also electing for the first time a Black woman as a mayor in Warner Robins. And uh, Mayor Cosby Johnson in Brunswick, Georgia, our first millennial Black mayor. So the wins are there. This is not not a fluke in Georgia. And so we have to remind our voters why it is so important to turn out this cycle. And we also specifically need to remind young voters to turn out. When I looked at the numbers for this past primary cycle, the majority of voters by far who turned out were over the age of 50. We have to remind young people that the decisions that are being made at the General Assembly impact them directly, including what they're learning in our public school system, including access to reproductive health, which is going to affect them more than people like me, um, and including access to health care, including livable wages. All of those things are instrumental to young people uh, and, of course, gun safety measures. So. We've got to make sure we remind people why it's important to vote. We have to make sure that we remind people what is on the line for us here in Georgia and the power that our state legislatures hold. Because the state legislatures, that, that is going to be what decides if we get any common sense gun reform. It's going to be what decides if we're going to protect women's reproductive health and women's health care in general. Um, so those are issues that are literally life or death issues. So we've got to show up and turn out in November. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, how can people find out more about you and get engaged with your campaign? My website is www.b, B, like a bumblebee, E E E F O R, and Georgia is spelled all the way out, dot com. My email is b at b4georgia.com. All my social media handles are at b for georgia I'm really proud of the race that we have run for Secretary of State and also proud to say that I've been endorsed by Stacey Abrams, who is our Democratic nominee for governor. And I look forward to continuing to build a diverse and 
um, multiracial, multi-generational coalition bringing together Georgians from every part of our state to deliver a win in November. Thank you so much, B. Well, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I am so well, so well. And how are you? I am doing well. Should I say Reverend or D? How do you prefer to Dr. Doc? What I mean, Dr. Hagler? How <laughs> do you prefer? You can call me D. You just call okay. me D. I yeah. like that. D and I'm O Yen. O Yen. Okay. Yen. Nice to meet you as well. Look, D, I want to start by saying I know this is a busy time. Um, and so on behalf of the Fed Democratic Women, I want to say thank you for allowing us the opportunity to just speak with you candidly about your runoff. Thank you so much, uh, Oye, oh yeah, and, and I'm glad to be with the Fayette uh, Democratic Women as I talk about my race and a little bit about myself. And so it's just a good day to be here with you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to, you know what, let you take the floor and just in a couple of minutes tell anyone who sees your um, billboard, I mean, you're not your billboards, your campaign signs, or maybe billboards. I don't know. We'll talk later about that. But anything about you, what do you want someone to know about when they're going into the polls and going into and, um, the runoff? What do you want people to know about you? That's a very good question. So one of the things I want people to know is that I am someone who loves the state of Georgia, who loves America, and who will fight uh, to the death for my people. Voting is very important for me, and especially for people to have the right to vote and access to the ballot box. And so I start there because uh, my very first campaign was done when I was about 12 years old. I started campaigning for uh, someone in my hometown to be on school board because we had never had an African-American person on school board. And I just wanted to uh, get him elected because I felt like a lot of the issues we were facing even then would be different if we had some type of representation. And so that led me to start a life of activism, a life of service, a life of uh, being out in the streets and being part of the solution. And so that led me to go to South Carolina State University and I majored in political science because I thought I was going to go to law school, but I knew I wanted to be involved in politics some way or another. And then upon graduating from South Carolina State University, where I met my husband, I actually met my husband there, our sophomore year, we um, uh, we were in a political science course together, and then we have been together ever since. We have four children, four adult children. Our baby just turned 21. <clears throat> he is a rising senior. Well, now he's a senior at Morehouse College. Um, and then uh, we have Hannah, who's a super senior at Clayton State. So she'll be graduating in December in film studies. So she's going to be our filmmaker. And uh, then we have Kristen who just graduated a couple of weeks ago from Morehouse School of Medicine. So I have an MD. And then we have Christopher, who's the oldest one, who's, you know, the one who made me a mom. And I just, uh, he, he, you know, he's my lyrical genius. He is a hip hop artist, but he also gave me my two grandchildren, Amari and Kingston. So those are my four children whom I am so proud of. Uh, me and my husband are so proud. And that's the formation. And that's why I start with family because it's all about family. When you start from a place of nurturing like I have, you care about everyone. You, When you in, in office, you bring everyone to the table with you. And so that's what I've done over my, my lifespan. My entire political career has been rooted deeply in family and family values. Um, so, so anyway, anyway, when my husband and I, we graduated from college, <clears throat> undergrad, we immediately went to Kentucky to go work on our graduate degrees uh, at Kentucky State University. Uh, we both received Masters of Public Administration there. And then I realized that God was not through me yet, so then we moved to Atlanta. Uh, in 1996, I came here to work on my PhD in political science. And then while there, uh, I, you know, had a call to the ministry. So I ended up going to seminary, I ended up going to ITC, a Turner Theological Seminary in Atlanta, getting a Master of Divinity. And all this time, I'm still doing work in the community, still pushing voting rights, still helping others uh, to become their great selves. So now this year, I've cele celebrated 25 years in ministry. I'm trying to speed up for you. And um, along the way, I've worked at voting rights organizations. I've been a nonprofit executive. I've worked in corporate America. I have uh, helped people scale up their businesses. And I just realized that every single thing I've done, including 
the nine years I spent in the Georgia General Assembly prepared me for positions such as Secretary of State, which covers all five, uh, all five divisions cover my entire lifespan. So that's one of the reasons why I'm running for Secretary of State because I bring with me, my life has been geared around a position and I never would have known the preparation was coming all along the way for such a time as this. Thank you for that. I feel like we know you a little more now. Thank you. I'm going to get right to our questions just so that, you know, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And so one of the things that we struggle with, particularly as a community, a diverse community is um, we don't own the media market. And so a lot of people who watch certain networks or, you know, have a certain area of listening to news and just adopting what they hear without doing any research, it's important for us to make sure that we educate voters so that when it's time to go to the polls, you're not intimidated because you don't even know who to vote for it. And we've seen that. We see it in the numbers. The Republicans are outvoting us. And that's not what we need. We need everyone to come out so that they can, that we have choices. And this is a good thing for us as a community. So what I would ask you, um, Dee, is why should this, why, <clears throat> sorry, I can't even talk. Why should this Secretary of State matter uh, race matter to Georgians, like because of the role of Secretary of State? Why should it matter to Georgians? And I'm glad you asked that. It should absolutely matter because that is your access to all of the services that you need. And what do I mean by that? It, it doesn't matter if it's the election division, which gives you the opportunity to vote for the person that you feel will do the best job uh, for you and your family and yourself uh, in the totality of life. So because we have so many things happening. We have uh, Medicaid expansion, which our state will not uh, participate in. We have school systems that still need um, more funding. And when people are in play, that determines who and how things will, how the budget will be allocated. Uh, when you look at the criminal justice system and you see racial profiling and other things like that, all these things can be remedied by the ballot box because you have to put the people in place who have the political will to do right, who understand the complexities of what's going on and how do we make an effective change. But not just that, the Secretary of State's office is the one that incorporates, incorporates businesses. And we have over 1 million businesses incorporated in the state of Georgia. Uh, small businesses are really the backbone of our economy. And what we have to do is make sure that they have the resources and skills they need at least from the Secretary of State's office that they can provide to make people uh, realize that those resources are even there for them, not to mention professional licensing. Uh, we have to think about all of the uh, registered nurses or physical therapists or uh, counselors or engineers or architects, funeral home directors, hairstylists, uh, barbers, uh, all of these people, electricians, plumbers, all of these people are licensed by the Secretary of State's office. And so when they cannot get their licensing in a timely manner or they have barricades, this keeps them from being able to take care of themselves or their families or their communities. And so these are simple bread and butter issues. And the Secretary of State's office is key to all of these things that I don't think people realize the magnitude of the office in and of itself and how it interweaves with our, day, with our daily lives. And so you have to have someone in place who has the education and the experience, professional experience as well as work experience to be able to execute a job of that magnitude. And I'm the only candidate who could do so. Yes, I think we should really talk about um, what the Secretary of State's office does and, and how it uh, impacts our daily lives. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So just speaking about the integrity of our elections, uh, your opponent has a track record of protecting voting rights. Tell us about your plan to fight against voter suppression so that Georgians have access to the polls. And that's a very good question. The first thing I'm gonna do was I meant to do this in the last question was talk about a little bit of misinformation. We have to make sure that we're putting out credible information and the Secretary of State's office is key to doing that because the Secretary of State has the ability under the budget to have uh, education all across the state of Georgia it, for things as simple as sending out a sample ballot to every single Georgia citizen with all of the candidates on Republican, Democrat, independent side, uh, having a link or, uh, or you know, 
the URL on the paper saying this is where you go to get more information, even if there's going to be ballot questions on uh, uh, during the election, you got to be able to know that. And so I don't know why we're trying to make it a secret. We've got to be able to share this information so our voters can be informative and not perpetuate lies such as uh, there was some type of massive voter fraud in 2020 that some kind of way uh, stole the election completely from uh, Donald Trump causing an insurrection in the United States Capitol in January. We, we've got to stop some of the you know, misinformation that's happening. Now, back to uh, uh, what will I do to protect voting rights and what I've heard about others. During my, now, when you were in the General Assembly, which my, both our opponent, me and my opponent have served time there, you have an obligation when you're there to, um, when you should, to fight for those things that are important to you based on the committees that you're on. Now, even though I was not on governmental affairs like she is, you know, to, to bring up legislation around voting, voting, I introduced so much voting legislation when I was there myself and not just working inside the General Assembly, but outside of the General Assembly. So prior to coming, uh, even running for office in 2003, 2004, 2005, I started off uh, doing this organization, America's Families United, and I worked out of D.C. <clears throat> on K Street, and we... Uh, gave money for people to do voter education, registration, mobilization. And this is how I got really truly engaged in many of the voting um, rights organizations because I funded them. I made sure that everybody had the money to do what they're doing now. So it's kind of like similar to what Fair Fight is doing now, New Georgia Project. I was doing this back when it wasn't even sexy. This is two, two, 2003. So we're talking about over 20 years of me doing this before others you know, came up with the idea to do it here in Georgia. But I funded organizations in Georgia like the People's Agenda and Rainbow Push and uh, the Urban League and the NAACP. So if you were any major African-American or Hispanic organization, that was around, around 2003, 2004, that you got money from our organization. I made sure that we gave you millions of dollars to do boots on the ground stuff around voting and to protect the vote. And this is where the massive voter protection came in. Um, it originated out of our office in DC. Um, now we have these hotlines that people talk about, but all of that stuff started then. This is why uh, people like, um, uh, Jesse Jackson, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, who people know for getting us started on um, the motor voter, uh, uh, automatic vo voter registration, you do motor vehicles and all the rest. Uh, I, you know, uh, was around during a lot of that time and was very helpful in getting that pushed across the board. And so now he's even supporting me in this race because he knows the work I've done my entire life. And it didn't start before the general, I mean, in the General Assembly, it started way before that and it continued way after. So even now, after I've been out for a few years, I've I filed lawsuits. I've been in part of lawsuits suing the Secretary of State's office, uh, trying to make sure that we still have a right to the access to the ballot box. I have traveled to the state. And even when I was the chair of the Black Caucus, I would hold hearings. I would, I would actually bring Brian Kemp in his office to explain to us, why are you purging people from the voting files? Or why are there people in Hancock County that's being harassed by the police um, trying to see if they are actually residents to cast their votes because they are flipping elections? Or why did you go after black women in Quitman, Georgia who were registering people to vote or doing an absentee ballot? So I didn't just talk about something and show up to a committee hearing, hearing. I was a leader and I called them to the table. So I wasn't a participant, I was the one who orchestrated. So so leadership matters. And so I am the only one who has that type of leadership skills. And I'm the only one who's ever had a leadership position in the General Assembly and outside. I mean, I served as chair of the Women's Caucus. I served as chair of the Black Caucus. I served as chair of my delegation in Rodale County, the treasurer of my delegation in Cab County. I served uh, as an officer uh, with the rule Caucus. I served as an officer in everything I've done, state government, women in government, national council, of uh, state legislative women, which includes everybody, uh, the National Black Caucus State Legislature, I've been an officer in every single one, and my opponent cannot say she's did in any of anything. So that's not to throw shade, it's just says that leadership matters, and we have to put the best person up who has a track record of getting things done. Thank you for that. Thank you for explaining your track record and what your plan is to fight. Since we're talking about that, could you speak a little bit 
um, about your strategy to debunk the Republican messaging. You know, that is predicated <laughs> on lies and, and misinformation. Mm -hmm. So can you share a little bit about that? With that? Yeah, so we have to continue just educating people. Uh, you have to meet people where they are. And so I'm also in a lot of organizations that are not political. And so many of those organizations, we do a lot around voter education, uh, registration and mobilization, and it ranges from whether it is my sorority, Delta Sigma Theta, to the National Council of Negro Women, or Top Ladies of Distinction, you know, the 100 Black Women. I don't know, because I probably left several out because um, I'm in so many, but all of them are geared around how do you educate people? On any given day, you may see somebody in the Divine Nine registering somebody to vote, mobilizing somebody to vote. And when I say Divine Nine, that's the nine Black Greek organizations, sororities and fraternities. You may see us out in the street doing that. Or it may be my Eastern Star Masonic, uh, Eastern Star Chapter Masonic Orders that are out getting information out because sometimes when we don't have access to the bully pulpit at that time, like the Secretary of State does in that position at that time, then you have to use all your other avenues. Use the Black church, something that I've doing, done for a long time. Use that as a way to get the right information out. But once you're in that seat, See, when you're in that seat, you can make sure that people understand what's at stake so that misinformation will not be uh, the norm. So you can give credible stats, credible uh, resources. People will know to come to the Secretary of State's office because they will have reliable in time messaging, not you're on a website and it's confusing. You don't know which button to click. You're trying to figure out how to uh, run for office or where to go vote for your candidate or when and where, where are the polling places? When did they change? And you don't want to be sent all over the place. You need a centralized place to do and learn everything there is about voting in the state of Georgia, as well as all the other offices. So that is what I would bring to the table, making sure that we are disseminating the right information. Let me tell you something. The Republicans have done a fabulous job, whether we want to admit it or not, of getting got bad information. If they can't do anything else, they can lie and people will hear it and they will believe it. So we have to be just as creative as them. We have to be uh, proactive. We have to make sure that we are locking down in all our areas uh, of lives, whether it is with school organizations, whether it's with civic, whether it is with church organizations, we have to be the ones to make sure that integrity is in our words and that we're speaking um, truth and we can back it up with receipts and tell people where to go because a lot of times people will just go by what they hear and sometimes if people do a google search they will believe it or they do a uh on the internet with these well, laugh i saw it on facebook it must be true oh god so we've got to do a better job of helping people to understand the truth and where they could find the truth and the secretary of state's office does have a budget millions of dollars for public communication and we've got to go now and try to clean up uh, a lot of misinformation is out there. Thank you for that. Okay. So let's talk about your plan for victory. Hypothetical scenario, but let's say you are declared the winner of the runoff. What is your first order of business to make sure Democrats beat Raffensperger in November? One of the things that we have to do is understand that we are not operating under with rainbows and Skittles right now. And I think what happens, uh, we want to act like, oh, if we get uh, a nominee, then we're going to be able to go up against Brad Raffensperger and immediately win. Let me tell you something. This is going to be a hard race to win. Why do I say that? First of all, we already had 20,000 Democrats that switched over to the Republican Party in the primary to vote for Brad Raffensperger because they feel like, oh, he's such a good man. So let me just say this. I... And yes, I can't speak to whether he's a good man, but I, what I will say is he did his job. And so now we're rewarding people for doing their job. Brad Raffensperger is not a friend of the Democratic or Democratic principles, let me be clear, because he's still trying to put barriers there for people to vote. So we have to be aggressive. We have to talk to those who are in our party and tell them they cannot be tricked just because someone stood up to Donald Trump. When in essence, it wasn't necessarily standing up to Donald Trump and his party. It was doing it what was required of you in the position of which you ran in. And it's a sad day in America when we are excited just because somebody did their job. Not to mention the people who got the contract or to oversee the contracts for the voting in the first place were his friends. And so what was he going to do? Say all the people that I hired and my friends did a bad job and they messed up the election? No, they would not do that. So let me just be very clear. 
We still have someone in place who's trying to suppress the votes of Black people who are still trying to put up barriers like add that extra layer, you got to put a driver's license on just to request the absentee ballot. Let's be very clear. He is not uh, a friend of democratic principles, and we're going to have to work extra hard. We're going to have to all pull up our you know, sleeves and get to work because it's not going to be just hard to beat Brad Raffensburg. It's going to be hard to beat Brian Kemp. And it's going to be hard to beat Raphael, I mean, uh, Walker, the football person, whatever. Um, it's going to be hard. Yeah, him, Herschel. It's going to be hard. I mean, because you still have people who mind are so twisted up and halfway, you know, it just doesn't make any sense because of all the miseducation that's out there and the, and the misinformation. So, I would just say that I would be ready to work and fight on day one because it's going to be a mammoth job to take on Brad Raffensperger. And that's what people need to keep in mind. Who is the best person to go up against Brad Raffensperger? So when we look at it, my opponent has endorsements. I have endorsements. I have endorsements from people all across the state. Many of them elected officials, many of them great leaders, preachers, uh, um, civic organization leads all of that but none of them will be able to stand in that seat and go up against Brad Raffensperger except the person that is on that ticket themselves and so we can bring up you know other people with us but that's not the same as being in a debate because nobody else is going to be able to debate him but the person who's the nominee nobody's going to be able to speak to him directly with force and be able to to say you know what did, you are not the right person for it. And, and whoever it is, trust and believe that the Republican Party has done their homework. So they're going to know who's battle tested and who's not. They're going to know information on, on all of us. And so when we make our decisions, we better we need to choose wisely because once we make our decision, we've got to go with it, whatever it is. And that person is going to have to be able to help us get across that finish line. I thank you for that. And in closing... What are your first two priorities um, as Secretary of State? Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of priorities, but the first one is going to be, I'm going to do an audit so we'll understand what's going on in the Secretary of State's office uh, and to make sure that there are no barriers to uh, the right to vote. We know that the entire country is watching this race because of voting, clearly. We know that they're trying to hold on to power and we know that the role of the Secretary of State is a powerful one. Secretary of State have determined entire elections. We know because we saw it when um, Trump was, I mean, when Gore was running against George Bush. We saw that. We saw what happened when the Secretary of State decided uh, whether or not dangling chairs and stuff was going to count. We know the power in that office. And so we've got to make sure that whoever's in the office, especially if it's me, that on day one, there are no barricades, no barriers to voting so that everyone, regardless of their party affiliation, will have free and fair access to that ballot box because that is the, uh, the the landmark of our democracy is making sure people can vote. So I got to go in and see what's going on, working with all 159 county uh, boards of election. And I've already met with so many of them over the uh, last four years. And so, because uh, I ran in 2018. And so now uh, that's number one. And number two, making sure that people understand that if you have something that you need from Secretary of State's office that's in there, in their purview that you will be able to get it, knowing that there is good customer service there. Because a lot of this job is going to be customer service oriented. This is not a job about activism. This is not a job about, you know, straight public policy. Oh, I went, and, you know, and stood up in front of whoever and said whatever. This is about who has the administrative skills, who's led organizations, who knows how to do organization and behavior, to put people in places. This is a massive job with a lot of thousands of employees and it needs to have someone at the helm who knows how to put everybody in place so that people, the average Georgia citizen will have good customer service when they call about voting, corporations, licensing, security and exchange or their nonprofit charities. That's what I intend to do on day one, start the ball rolling. Well, I wanna say thank you that is a wrap for us. I think you did um, a wonderful job at letting voters know who you are, what you plan to bring. But before we wrap up, I have to ask you, how can voters reach you right now? You're in the midst of a runoff. 
what do you want to leave? How, how, can, how can voters help? Just let us know. That's very good. Voters can reach me um, on um, my social media. They can reach me at D Dawkins Hagler for Georgia. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. I do have a Twitter page. I don't use it often. So use those other two. But they can also call me. Y'all can call me directly. I don't have a problem with people calling me. 404-998-3034. Um, call me. Reach out. I'm accessible. And finally, you can go to my website at www.dforgeorgia.com. That's D-E-E-F-O-R. G-E-O-R-G-I-A.com and they'll be able to find me there. But listen, you know what? Just pick up the phone. I'll be here. I'll answer. Um, if I don't answer, leave a message and I'll try to get back to you uh, because you also have to have people who are accessible. I'm more accessible now. Hopefully when we become the Secretary of State, I'll still be as accessible, but I will make sure that the office is accessible to the things that you need. And so I appreciate you and the Fayette uh, Democratic Women's um, Democratic women. And so congratulations to you on being Madam President. And we know that you are going to do great things and we're looking forward to it in the future. Thank you so much. I know you have a race to run. And so with that, thank you for, for completing our first one-on-one -on -one session with In Candidate Conversations. Um For the Georgia Insurance Commissioner race, I was able to sit down with Raphael Baker to learn more about his candidacy as a first-time candidate. Welcome to Candidate Conversations through the Fed Democratic Women. Hey, thank you so much, and thank you to the Fed Democratic Women for having me. I am Raphael Baker. I am candidate for Insurance Commissioner. I recently made it into the runoff with over 221,000 votes. So you know what? Hey, if you voted for me, thank you. And if you didn't, take a second look. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for that quick introduction. Let's talk a little bit about your background. So what about your background makes you the right person for in insurance commissioner? Okay, thank you for that question. So, you know, first and foremost, I have been in the insurance industry for over 20 years, and that's continuously. You know, there's other candidates that have been licensed as long, but they're not actively practicing insurance. And the thing about insurance, if you're not actively practicing, you get left behind. It is constantly evolving. We have so many things that change, sometimes even daily. So I'm in tune completely with the industry. I started my insurance career as a front desk receptionist. I was answering phones, taking payments. And then, you know, I ended up getting my licenses and I went into the sales arena. Fast forward, had my own agency for six years. And for the past five years, I've been over on the corporate leadership side. And in this role, I've been hiring, prom like hiring, I've been mentoring, training and developing the next generation of agency owners. But my experience isn't all that qualifies me to be Georgia's next insurance commissioner. You know, I have a heart. So my best friend had kidney failure. And during the three years that he was suffering from this chronic disease, I spent a lot of times in and out the hospital. You know, I did not trust the Georgia healthcare system. So sometimes I was in the hospital for two and three weeks straight. I'd be in there working with my laptop, but I had to be there to be his advocate. You know, he passed away, but you know, I'm changing my pain into purpose. There's so many people in Georgia who don't have a Raphael. They don't have an advocate. They don't have a voice. So I'm going to be the voice for the people. Okay, thank you for that. So I was listening to your opponent and your opponent is open to the use of alternate solutions until the Medicaid expansion debate is settled. Can you tell us about your plan for ensuring every Georgian has access to health care insurance? Yes. So first of all, you know, I'm a fighter and we are going to get Medicaid expanded. 
there's several ways. You know, the current governor didn't sign that into law because he wanted a work clause in there. We can't have a work clause in there. People are sick. We are still in the midst of a pandemic. If you're sick, how can you work? You know, a lot of times the Republicans are talking about pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But what about these people who don't have shoes? Additionally, there's other ways that we can reduce health care costs, you know, for people who might not necessarily qualify for Medicaid. So one of them, you know, we can definitely use preventative care. Ben Franklin famously said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. There's also a lot of low value services that are utilized, such as unnecessary tests, unnecessary CAT scans. We can incentivize these insurance companies to use less of that. Now, we're not saying that people can't get it when they need them, but when they don't need them, let's cut that out. I mean, I remember getting bills from my best friend sometimes when he was stay in the hospital, 200 plus thousand dollars for a stay for a week. That's ridiculous. Another way to drive down the cost of health care, we need to get with our legislators. We need to get with these Raphael Warnocks. You know, he is trying to reduce the prescription cost for insulin, but we need to do that with other life-saving drugs. Insulin is extremely expensive. HIV drugs are extremely expensive. You know, sometimes thousands of dollars a month. And we have to stop that. We can also utilize a lot of the generic drugs that have the same impact, but cost so much less. I mean, these pharma companies are making big bucks. Every time you turn on the TV, I guarantee you, you're going to see five, six, seven commercials about pills. They are pill happy and it is a business. But we have to stop that because our Georgians need our help. Thank you for that. Um, well, tell us how you will improve consumer protections and transparency in the insurance commissioner's office, particularly okay. with the background. Okay, so, so first of all, transparency begins from the top. So you cannot have an insurance commissioner that is fake, fraudulent, or phony, or smoke and mirrors. If you follow my campaign, or even if you're watching this interview, I'm transparent and the same person you see now is the same person you are going to get in office. So it starts from the top. After that, we're going to use our website. First of all, that website needs revamping. It's a piece of trash, but you didn't hear that from me. We're going to revamp it, but we're going to post things. We're going to post findings of investigations. We're going to post, you know, a lot of things if, if we've suspected and we've prosecuted fraud, you know, on the company side, on the agent side, and even on the con consumer side. But additionally, I'm going to be present. You know, a lot of these so-called politicians, you only see them on the campaign trail. That's not true of me. I'm one of these people. I am always among the people because I am one of the people. So we're going to host town halls. We're going to do press conferences. We're going to go on social media and do live Q&As. You're always going to have a way to contact me. Even during this campaign, a lot of people that reach out to the campaign and send us emails, they get surprised because guess what? I'm going to rep reply personally because I care. And I must say you did. I do. You did. I appreciate that. So as we close this interview, I have a hypothetical scenario for you. So let's think we plan for victory. Okay. So you're declared the winner of the runoff. What is your first order of business to make sure Democrats beat John King in November? Okay. So when I win this runoff, when I win this runoff, you know, our strategy does, does not stop at the runoff, but you know, we, we have to rally the troops. You know, right now, the Democratic Party doesn't support anybody until they actually become the nominee. So we're going to have meetings with some key figures in the Democratic Party. Another thing that we're going to do, we're going to continue hitting these streets. We're going to go throughout Georgia and spread our message. And the thing about our message, my message isn't just Democratic. This message applies to Democrats, Republicans, independents. You know, insurance honestly shouldn't be politicized, but unfortunately it is. But everybody needs health care. 
everybody needs car insurance, everybody needs homeowner insurance, and everybody needs an advocate. So my message is going to absolutely extend to all Georgians because I truly am for the entirety of Georgia. And, you know, we're going to start strategizing because we know those Republicans fight dirty. We know that. But that's why you cannot have a Democratic nominee for insurance commissioner that is afraid to fight. I'm going to tell you, I'm fearless. I am not shaken. I am unapologetic. And I'm going to be bold. The Democratic Party needs people that are bold and unafraid. I'm something fresh. I'm something new. And I'm ready to box in November. All right. Well, I appreciate that. We are ready to watch the fight in, a, in the best way, I should say. I want to just wrap this up by giving you 30 seconds to tell the person going into the voting block. They see your name. They see your candidate. Why, again, are you the best choice? You see my name. The reason you need to go ahead and check that is because, hands down, on both sides of the aisle, I am the most qualified candidate with over two decades of continuous experience. Secondly, I have a heart for service. You can do a deep dive on my record, Google my name. You're going to see, you know, I am always giving back because to whom much is given, much is required. Next, I am a fighter. We can't have anybody weak that's going to go up against John King in November. And I, again, am unafraid, I'm bold, and unapologetic. Last thing, I am for the people. I am a person before I'm a politician. This is my first time hopping into a race, but I did it because, again, Georgia deserves somebody that's going to absolutely fight for them, and not somebody that's just going to say they are. Somebody that's actually going to do the work. If you want to find me, my website is Raphael Baker for georgia.com. That's all spelled out. And my first name is spelled just like Raphael Warnock. I'm the other Raphael. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Raphael Baker for Georgia. That's all spelled out. But again, I really appreciate this opportunity. Well, we appreciate you. So thank you so much. Um, we will have our eyes and ears all around. And I appreciate you for coming on this platform. Can you guarantee us that you will come back and visit the Fair Democratic Women when the race is over? I guarantee you I will come back. You all wow. can have me anytime you want. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. You. And good luck on your race. Thank you. All right. We reached out to Georgia Insurance Commissioner candidate Shanice Laws Robinson. She was unavailable for this interview, but for fairness, we want to make sure folks know where to go to find out more information about her. You can visit her website at JaniceForGeorgia.com. That's JaniceForGeorgia.com. Stay connected with us. We're on social media. Follow us at Fayette Democratic Women. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Our website is FayetteDemocraticWomen.org. Here's what you can do there. You can become a member. You can volunteer, subscribe to our communication, and of course, you can donate. Your donations help us support progressive candidates. Thank you again. Until next week. Bye.